This is Need to Know. Real talk about the reality of unidentified aerial phenomena. From Australia, Ross Coltart. From the US, Bryce Zabel. Well, it's good to be back, and we have had something of an absence, and I think that requires some explanation. So I'm going to bring my co-host, buddy and good colleague, Bryce, in to explain what's been going on. Well, there's a lot been going on, and we could lay it off too well. We've been doing an intense investigation, but what actually happened is my daughter came back uh, home from a trip and uh, had gotten... Um, uh, what do we call it? A strep throat from a, a karaoke session. So I got it. Then two days later, my wife shows up and she's got COVID. And now I have COVID and strep throat. So yeah, I kind of went into about a, a two week tunnel where it was all I could do to get up in the morning and then go back to bed. So, but now I feel better. I'm back uh, and I'm ready. Now, we're doing this recording on March the 15th, which is an auspicious date in history, Bryce. The, the Ides of March, notable in Rome as a time of settling debts, and also apparently, maybe you can refresh my memory. What, yeah, some what, little, the... little thing like the assassination of Julius Caesar, I think, happened on, on that time in 44 BC. Uh, I don't know that we'll be as auspicious today as uh, Caesar's passing probably was, but I'm willing to give it a try. So listen, it's been quite a news time in the period since we last spoke. And I, I think one of the things that fascinates me is particularly from the Daily Mail, Josh Boswell, Christopher Sharp, Liberation Times, there's been a lot of talk that we're going to see congressional hearings. There's a lot of speculation about a new push in Congress for public hearings into purported secret UAP reverse engineering programs, which is a, a big claim. And um, I know Lua Elizondo has made a new statement as well, where he's basically applauded efforts to get to the bottom of any legacy efforts to exploit UAP materials. And he said, not just looking at Lockheed Martin, I would not limit the focus of the inquiry to just one aerospace company, but to several others that have played a key historical role in this endeavor. So we're being told, my friend, that there is an ongoing push behind the scenes for people to come forward and for possibly, you know, the, the increased chance of public hearings. You know, the thing, Ross, that is funny about that Lou Elizondo uh, uh, statement that you read, where he says, I applaud the effort to get to the bottom of any legacy efforts to exploit blah, 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 and then ending where you, you just said, for a guy that keeps quoting his NDA, I can't talk about this, I can't talk about that, he always manages to literally state what he means, which in this case, if he's saying, I would also go one step further and not limit the focus of the inquiry to just one aerospace company, but to several others that have played a key role. Well, okay, I guess Lou Elizondo <laughs> is coming right out and saying, yeah, there's crash wreckage out there and there are legacy programs that have been looking into it and some of them are private aerospace. So, you know, to the extent, I know people fall into the pro-Lou and anti-Lou column these days, which is unfortunate, but if you trust what Lou Elizondo is saying, he's saying it again. There's crash wreckage, there's private companies that have been looking into it and he thinks it's about time to do that. So the only question I had about what you just said, though, is, yeah, there is a lot of speculation about these, uh, the, the possibility of more public hearings. But my question is, who's doing all this speculating? You know, where, where is the heart of the speculation? Uh, and, and how informed is it? Look, it's a good question. And, and one of the issues is that, frankly, none of us really know. None of us really know for sure. I mean, a lot of people, myself included, are being encouraged to the belief that there is a push towards a greater disclosure in the Congress. And frankly, I'm not sure we should buy it. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very skeptical about a lot of what we're being told at the moment. I mean, for example, let's just deal with one thing. Um, and I think this is quite important because it's kind of slipped through the cracks in the news language recently. What I can tell you, Bryce, is that I know for a fact that there are people who have given evidence to Congress in camera, who purport to have knowledge of the program, mm -hmm. um, and there are people who are coming forward who purport to have knowledge of the program, if the program exists. I think we should all maintain 
severe skepticism. Um, just to correct that, just to go deeper, skepticism about the fact that a program existed or skepticism about the fact that they're actually ready to have public hearings of some kind? Both. Both. All right. Both. I mean, I, I, I still think we need to be very, very strict with ourselves in testing claims that are being made. Um, so let's, for example, I mean, one of the things that just bobbed up in the news in the last few days is... And you've got to you've got to figure this out by putting together various bits of a jigsaw. But it's very clear that Rep Representative Tim Burchett and Matt Gates, uh, two Republican congressmen, appear to have attended a classified UAP briefing on a military base somewhere in Florida, on or around February the twenty first. And um, I think this is an important story because it's illustrative of what's going on behind the scenes. Neither of them can talk about it in all that much detail publicly. But what we do know is um, Matt Gates first came out, and he's a controversial figure because he's done <laughs> some pretty wacky and said some pretty wacky things in his time. He came out, and he's a member of the House Armed Services Committee. So he does have the right to be briefed on these UAP issues because the House Armed Services Committee is one of the committees that is dealing with this UAP issue. And I know that staffers on that committee are engaging with people, inviting them to come forward. Anyway, in a discussion on Newsmax, the news organization, Gates talked about how he'd seen evidence of a mysterious craft that did not appear to belong to the US, its allies or adversaries. And he said, I have seen evidence of craft that I am not familiar with any of our allies or adversaries or even of our country possessing. I've seen that craft taken by air crews, I think he means photograph, who've gotten quite close to it. And we've got a lot more questions about why this information isn't more broadly available to the American people. If there's stuff flying over our skies and we don't know about it, whether it's Chinese or whether it's unworldly, I think we need a lot more transparency. And we've actually got a group of Congress members together and we're going to be conducting a lot more investigations and trying to get this information before the public so that we can have a lot more assessment of the threat level and the risk level. So that's why people are talking about public hearings. Gates has talked about it on the Newsmax channel. Sure. And his comments also followed an interview with Newsweek magazine when Congressman Tim Burchett um, he basically told Newsweek that he believed, quote, we have recovered a craft at some point and possible beings. I think that's a lot of that's being reverse engineered right now, but we just don't understand it, he said. And in the same interview with Matt Gates, Tim Burchard appeared as well on the Newsmax interview. And he admitted he was in a meeting together with Gates the previous day in Florida. That was the key word. And he said, mm -hmm. I can't talk about it. It was classified top secret, so I can't talk about it. And then to complete the next bit of the jigsaw puzzle, that was all that Birchett could say about the briefing he received. But then Fox News' Tucker Carlson did an interview with a podcast called Full Max, in which he described a recent conversation with a congressman who went to a briefing in the state of Florida. And I uh, I think it's reasonable to speculate that's got to be Burchett and by implication also Gates, who's also talked about being briefed in Florida. And Carlson told the podcast, four of these things like a Raptor pilot, an American pilot, took these images of these objects right next to his plane. And then he goes on to talk about how they got a thermal read on them and the thermal read was at the bottom of the plane. And frankly, what Carlson says doesn't quite make a lot of sense. But my takeaway is that both Burchett and Gates appear to have been shown classified images at a Florida base of some kind, probably an Air Force base. And these craft are four anomalous craft photographed right next to US aircraft. And they were shown this allegedly by, quote, a commanding general. Well, so that's there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. Um, and first of all, folks, before I go any further, please don't send me email about being a partisan on this whole thing. I, I, look, Gates is controversial, as, as Ross said. Um, and I wish that the same statement was coming from somebody a little less to one spectrum or the other, because it would it would sort of help with the credibility of it. I wonder, and, and Ross, this is a good 
question, I think, is, is the issue starting to be politicized? Are we starting to see Republicans drift into one column and Democrats into another? I'm not quite sure, but I, I had a lot of questions when we were talking about this initially, which is why Gates and Burchett? Why Florida? Uh, you know, because if you're going to be getting a deep briefing, it, traditionally that happens at, in one of those secure compartmentalized information facilities uh, in, under the Capitol or somewhere in D.C. and uh, instead of a Florida Air Force Base. So these are the things I'm thinking about. But, I, you know, as the as the historian here, I just wanted to throw one thing out because later on we were going to talk about some of the things that happened uh, 50 years ago in 1973. Well, 50 years ago. In 1973, it's reputed that there was another historic visit by two people uh, involved in uh, one of who was heavily involved in Washington politics to a Florida Air Force base. I'm talking about the Homestead Air Force Base visit, supposedly, where Richard Nixon took his buddy, uh, comedian Jackie Gleason, in the middle of the night and took him to Homestead Air Force Base and introduced him to some wreckage and some bodies. Nobody's ever been able to tie that down, but uh, Gleason allegedly. to the end. Yeah, what's that? Allegedly. No, I, totally allegedly. Uh, no one's ever been able to tie that down, but Gleason to the end of his days always said it happened. No one else uh, has laid it out like that. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there as, as just, yeah, these things come up. But let me go back to these questions. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Why them? Why Florida? Okay, Tim Burchett's been quite prominent in speaking out on this issue, uh, and he's been pushing. You know, yeah. he's been he's been he's been asking for briefings, and and um, he's on the House Oversight and Accountability Committee. So I guess to some degree he has a right to ask. And Matt Gates, of course, is on the um, Armed Services Committee on the House, so he has an absolute right to ask as a committee member. So maybe it's as simple as they've asked for a briefing. We just don't know because, as Tim Burchett says, it's all top secret and they've probably transgressed by even talking about it. What intrigues me is I'm aware of other people who've received similar briefings. And, you know, this has been going on. This is what's happening at the moment behind the scenes is there are these kind of briefings happening. People, congressmen, um, key opinion leaders are being shown information. And I just wonder what the agenda is, like what's driving this. Um, I, have a, I have a suspicion that part of what is driving this is an attempt to contain. I wish it was a contempt, an attempt to, to disclose or, or just for the God's sake, just let's just get a clear breast of what the hell is going on here and bring it all out into the open and we can test the data, look at the evidence and make a judgment about whether any of this is true. But I, I, somebody's playing a game behind the scenes, and I, I don't yeah. like it. I really don't like it. I agree with you that ultimately, if it's okay to show two politicians four allegedly anomalous objects sitting next to a US Air Force uh, fighter jet, or maybe it was a Navy fighter jet, um, uh, why the hell can't the public see it? And okay, I, there might be there might be some reason. There might be something to do with the sensor systems or the the capabilities of U.S. photographic reconnaissance, which means that it's not it's not allowed to show the public because to do so would reveal systems or technologies which can't be revealed. But I'm told that in many cases, what these are are photographs taken by pilots with. Good old fashioned A type mobile yeah. phones, you know. So why the hell can't we see this I, stuff? And 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 rather than baiting us and getting people like uh, Matt Gates and Tim Burchett to put out claims on on U.S. national media, which frankly sink and disappear without trace, um, why not just put it out there? I mean, essentially, if I, the U.S. Air Force is briefing people, let's see it. Let's see the briefing material. I mean, I got to tell you. Well, you know this above above anybody, but most of our listeners and uh, viewers do as well. I'm just a radical on this subject. I've just, I'm fed up. This has been 75 to 80 years where this has been going on. And I, you know, you release one crystal clear photo or one fantastically uh, clear video and it's, 
it's not game over, but it's at least we've switched from, do they exist? Don't they exist? What are they? Can we, if you see one of these things in, in, in the shocking reality that other people have seen, then I think we would move to a new phase very quickly. You know, it's so, yeah, we should get that done. It, there's absolutely no reason that the American public and the world community have not seen some crystal clear photos taken by the militaries of the world. And that would not necessarily uh, ruin anybody's day when it came to, uh, uh, you know, keeping track of the technology they have and not wanting to share it with uh, their adversaries. The second part of that, though, is that the outlines of what these photos and, and various things are have emerged from uh, pilot testimony. They just don't have access to uh, being able to show us the, the, the film and the, or the video and the photos that they have seen. For example, Ryan Graves, who we all know is a jet fighter pilot who now has a really terrific podcast of his own called Merged. I mean, he describes a couple of jets flying along together and a thing flies between them. And that thing I'm quoting now was an object that was quote, dark gray or black cube inside of a clear sphere. Now, I mean, come on, let's see that photo. That photo exists. Why can't we see it? I mean, it's just irritating. I'm an irritated man over this topic. I'm never going to get over it. I'm never going to stop agitating for it. And, uh, you know, I don't care whether you're a skeptic or a believer or somewhere in between on the spectrum. Uh, we paid for the uh, aircraft and the systems that are able to gather this information. We did not give somebody a blank check and say, never, ever let us know what you get with it. We've actually financed it. And it's time to at least stop this. So if there are going to be public hearings, they could start the public hearing with a single great photo. And I would, I'd be a happy man. Yeah. I'm not a hundred percent sure by the way, that that particular incident where the object flew between the two jets, I don't think they've ever said that there's an actual photograph of that happening, mm. but I do think that there are images and sensor system data that from all of those incidents off the East coast and the West coast. And just while we're on the the, the, the issue of what's been seen by US Navy jets. Um, it's really interesting, just in the last few hours, our friends at the uh, Mail, Josh Boswell from the Mail has broken a story in the Daily Mail, which I think he's applied a little bit of stick to what Jay Stratton said. But essentially, the former head of the government's UFO task force, Jay Stratton, and uh, Travis Taylor, the chief scientist on that task force, they spoke at AlienCon in Pasadena, uh, Pasadena in early March, and they talked about the fact that they'd investigated the objects that buzzed around a fleet of eight Navy ships off the US West Coast in July of 2019. And remember, Bryce, this is the stuff that you and I, in our special with Spotlight, we went to Jeremy Corbell's um, office and we actually investigated with Jeremy what what was being looked at, for example, the weird objects over the USS Omaha and the splash, splash, splash video where the object appears to go into the ocean. Now, at AlienCon, both Stratton and Taylor left them worried that whatever this was, it was a conclusion that Russia or China could have achieved some kind of incredible drone battery technology. Or maybe they'd launched quadcopters, quadcopters from submarines that somehow evaded the Navy's best radar miles from the mainland. But what, what the Daily Mail says is that the story uh, that was put by the Pentagon to the Congress, and this is a very serious allegation, essentially... Um, the story that was put by the Pentagon bosses to the politicians and the public last year in the speech to Congress, it suggested that what Jay Stratton told Alien Con was that this was a misrepresentation to the Congress, i.e. that the former head of the UFO task force is, is allegedly stating that Congress was deliberately misled by Scott Bray, the Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, and Ronald Moultrie, the Under Secretary of Defence for Intelligence and Security, when they testified to the House Intelligence Committee. <clears throat> and um, this matters, Bryce, and I, I think it requires explanation because apparently um, the department's now saying it stands by the testimony given by Bray and Moultrie. But um, Taylor 
Travis Taylor said he and Stratton watched the presentation at their new employees, uh, employers, Radiance Technologies. And when they started talking about the USS Russell incident, Travis says, quote, I was like, we did not brief him that way. This is this is not what we told him. It really, really did upset both Travis and me when we were watching that hearing, Stratton added. I would not have gone and briefed Congress that I believe these triangular-shaped objects to be real without my ducks in a row and the ability to answer any question thrown at me. And this is important. This matters because... Has a misrepresentation been made to Congress? That's the worry. Well, yes, it has. Um, you know, let's forget the Daily Mail as the source of it. They People attack them for the type of newspaper they are, but at least they're boldly going out there. Look at the source instead. The sources are Jay Stratton and Travis Taylor, who are pretty impeccable sources. And, you know, just one thought. It wasn't a speech to Congress, in in my view, on May 17th of 2022. It was sworn testimony tendered. No, it wasn't. It wasn't sworn. Actually, it's funny. I went back oh. and double checked this. Yeah, they were not put under oath. And I, I, I really think this well, is important. Neither Moultrie nor Bray were put under oath. But well, by golly, if the, if they have misled Congress, that's a worry. I not only is it a worry if I was uh, in Congress and it looks like some of the people who are in Congress are equally as ticked off. Um, I would just say I'm not taking people in for a public hearing on something and letting them lie and or misrepresent to us. And I would hold them accountable. But uh, obviously, if there are going to be public hearings in the future, uh, they better start with somebody holding up their hand and swearing to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help them, whatever. So. I, I think it is time to start swearing people in because how else do you hold them accountable? And but the, but the other thing about this is, it you and I knew this. In fact, most people who watched that hearing, we said, how in the world could a topic this complex, with this much data that's been come up with over the past seven to eight decades, how could you start as these guys did and and take the position that they took and and frankly, most people on that committee let them get away with it. Even the people who knew that they were uh, prevaricating or at least uh, misleading. So, yeah, the whole the the uh, I, I must say this, and I think you agree with me on this. Uh, the, there's no panacea to public hearings. You can have a public hearing and witness what uh, Moultrie and Bray did. They went to a public hearing. They put on their nice suits and their uniforms, or and they they came in there and they. They tried their best not to be direct with the American people. I resent it as a citizen. I resent it as a taxpayer. Uh, I resent it as someone who wants to hear the truth, who figures I'm due to hear it one of these days. So we've got to get these people wised up before we start hauling them back into public hearings. So I hope that the people we're talking about, whether it's Burchett, uh, whether whether it's Matt Gates, whether it's any of the people from Gillibrand and Rubio and all the other people, uh, uh, who have been involved in this, they need to toughen up and make sure that the people they are going to put in these committee hearings know that their their testimony means something. And if they don't uh, take a direct approach with the questions, they are going to be held responsible and other people are going to be brought in to comment on whether they're being directly uh, honest or not. It's, well, this has to end. Yeah, look, I agree. But but also, let's be very clear about this. Nobody here is suggesting that whatever these objects are, they are inevitably anomalous or paranormal. Essentially, all we're asking for is an investigation into the mystery. And, and the thing that fascinates me in the Daily Mail story that Josh Boswell's done today is that Stratton told the AlienCon conference, and he obviously didn't intend for this to be recorded, so somebody's very naughtily recorded this and taken a transcript, but thank heavens for posterity that somebody did. He said, I got an email from the carrier strike group commander saying, Jay, we've got some UAP, referring to unidentified anomalous phenomena. I had a guy on board as carrier within a day in order to start educating, start collecting data, start getting the folks talking, going to each ship in a helicopter and bringing everything back to DC immediately. 
They claim that far from a simple case of a misidentified drone, which is, if you remember, mate, what Congress was told, Congress was told that these were misidentified drones. There was a very clear impression given that what we were talking about here was, was drone technology. Rather than a simple case of a misidentified drone, it was a shocking event involving multiple US ships swarmed by around 100 objects, some truly triangle-shaped that flew for such long distances and times they feared America's adversaries had cracked breakthrough battery technology. The incidents went on for hours and were repeated through the month. Now, Stratton actually is quoted in the uh, in the article from the Alien Con Conference as saying that he had a high enough security clearance to determine that the objects were not US operated. We had a much bigger picture, he said. When we were briefing the seniors, the briefing was very detailed and highly footnoted. Um, it, it, it sounds like he and Travis did a very thorough investigation. And Jay's basically told the, con the alien con, Moultrie and Bray, quote, just weren't briefed to the level that I would have prepared them. And as Travis Taylor says, it seemed odd. It felt like we'd been practicing all year, got to the playoffs and lost 42 nil. It was a real <laughs> weird kick in the guts. Now, that implies, I mean, it's a really interesting situation here. You've got the former head of the Pentagon's UAP investigation program saying they investigated this technology and they could not explain these away as drones or known drone technology. Now, nobody is saying that this is aliens. Nobody is saying this is paranormal. All they're basically saying is that this is a mystery. Have the Chinese or the Russians developed technology which allows them to operate some kind of new drone or balloon technology over US warships in a restricted training area in a way that's never been done before? That's why this matters. And what matters is why were Moultrie and Bray trying to play it down in their evidence to Congress? And did they mislead Congress as Jay Stratton and Travis Taylor appear to have told Alien Con they were? You know, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. You, you're being uh, what a good journalist should be. You're being cautious. You're saying nobody is saying this is aliens. That is technically true. Nobody is saying this is aliens or even paranormal or even anomalous, although the name of the office is the All Domain uh, Anomaly Resolution Office. So whatever. Um, here's my problem with continuing to say that. While it is possible that Russia or China has come up with hundreds of drone swarms that can be out there doing that, um, I don't think that's the first explanation that we should be looking for. It's, a, it's an explanation, but that's knowable and doable, but it doesn't explain the kinds of things that have been reported, not just by citizens uh, from around the entire planet, but by militaries from around the entire planet going back these 75 or 80 years. So those things were not Russia or China back in the early days. And yet we reported uh, through our military, many of the same kind of behaviors and some that were even more strange. So from my point of view, no, I'm not willing to say anything is alien. Alien to many people just means, okay, they're extraterrestrials. They're coming from someplace that isn't here to here, and they're being flown by somebody that isn't us. I get that. I'm not saying they're aliens, but I'm saying that the more likely resolution of this thing is going to take us into some strange, anomalous explanations. And that's why I get more and more frustrated by the U.S. military and, frankly, the militaries of the rest of the world, which are all playing in concert uh, and have been for many decades with the United States on this issue. Uh, I, I'm frustrated that they will not take us to this next level. If we're supposed to determine whether they're uh, anomalous, alien, or plain drones from somebody, then how about sharing your work? These people have been doing it on our budget for all these years, and they're not sharing their work. In fact, as you pointed out, and as you and I were appalled to watch on May 17th, uh, they're, they're, they're not telling the truth. They're trying deliberately to play down things, and they shouldn't be doing that. And, uh, you know, we had that same member on that same show, Lou Elizondo was on with us, and he was as appalled as we were. And, and frankly, he's been on the inside. So, 
I, I just, I, I think it's not going to be drones. Uh, I, there, may, there are drones out there, but I don't look at this final resolution that we're coming up on, hopefully, as going as one that lays out the drone card and says, okay, nothing to see here for the last eight decades. It was all Chinese drones. Well, if it was Chinese drones, Ross, then they're also time traveling drones because they went back to the 40s and 50s and 60s. And I don't think I love we're that. talking about that. I love the way you always go back to the history, mate, and it's good. Yeah. It's one of your strengths. I, I just love the fact that, as you say, there is this incredible rich archive of sightings going back 70, 80, 100, thousands Absolutely. of years. You know, phenomena that has been seen by humanity over many, many years that cannot be explained, including the kind of swarms that we're talking about here. Let's go on to something else. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if people remember that... Um, Oh, gosh, must have been last year sometime. Uh, the philosopher Sam Harris and mm. now more recently Eric Weinstein have both talked about the fact that they have been approached by unnamed purported government officials offering to give them insights about UAPs, offering to give them information about the secrets of UAPs. And um, on a Lex Fridman podcast recently, Harris explained that um, – Lex asked him about it. I love Lex's podcasts, by the way. They're fantastic. Harris explained in response to Lex's questions about this, I think Eric went down this rabbit hole further than I did. We were contacted by the same person. It wasn't clear to me who this person was or how this person got my cell phone number. They didn't seem like we were getting punked. I presume he means tricked there. Is that what that means? This person well, there's, a show, there's a show that was done uh, in the last decade, I believe, maybe two decades ago called Punk. And it was basically, I think, Ashton Kutcher, um, who would literally, it was like Candid Camera, but it was on MTV oh, okay. and it was Punk. All right. Okay. So, so um, Sam said, this person seemed credible to me. And Lex comes in and says, so they were talking to you about the release of different videos about UAPs. And Harris says, yeah, this was when there was a big flurry of activity around this. There was a New Yorker article on UFOs. There was rumors of congressional hearings, I think, coming. And there was the videos that were being debunked or not. And so this person contacted both of us, I think, around the same time. What happened, Sam Harris says, is that the person kept writing a check that he didn't cash. It's a great line. Like he kept saying, next week, I understand this is sounding spooky and you have no reason to really trust me, but next week I'm going to put you on a Zoom call with people who you will recognize. And they're going to be former heads of the CIA, people who within five seconds of being on the Zoom call, you will know this is not a hoax. I said, great, just let me know. Just send me the Zoom link. And that happened maybe three times. Um, and it's worth reading this in full because it's important. Phone conversation and then a bunch of texts. And then I think Eric spent more time with this person and I haven't spoken about it. I think he's spoken about it publicly. So it's not that my bullshit detector ever went off, Sam Harris says, in a really big way. It's just the thing never happened. I lost interest. And it's really interesting to me because I've been approached by similar people purporting to be from the intelligence community, and they've never come up with the goods either. No. And just part of me is wondering, were Sam Harris and Eric Weinstein punked? Or was there a deliberate attempt by somebody in government to basically give them the impression that at some stage they were going to be, I think the way Eric described it, Eric Weinstein seems to have suggested that at one stage he was being told they were going to be flown to a Colorado Air Force base, they'd be blindfolded and they'd be taken and shown things, which frankly for anybody would be tempting. But is it possible they were punked, that they were tricked, that they were being pulled along by a Walter Mitty? There are Walter Mitty's out there and oh, there are people who are purporting to have government connections who don't. Well, were they punked? Uh, is it possible? Yeah. I mean, it's totally possible they were punked. However, um, you know, as you mentioned, you've, you've had similar kinds of approaches. And I, I'm semi-infamous because the same thing kind of happened to me during the Dark Skies series. And one of the reasons that we have had some time off is 
by the way, to our listeners and viewers, Ross has been working on the U.S. edition of In Plain Sight, where you've added a couple of new chapters. And <clears throat> I've been working on preparing a, a show that we're going to do next, uh, probably for Channel 7 uh, Spotlight Australia, where we look into the very case that you're that that I'm referring to, where my co-creator on Dark Skies, uh, Brent Friedman and myself, were either punked or approached by the Office of Naval Intelligence. I'm not going to say too much more about it. It's a story that has been told a couple of times, but what we're going to try to do is uh, tell it in the greatest depth that it's ever been told. And so I've given a lot of thought to this, Ross. I, I think can about I, can this. I just, I, I, yeah. don't, 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 yeah. don't bury your lead, mate. Um, okay. We have some amazing new information in that story. Yes. That, uh, <clears> we I'm, did. I'm, and I'm quite excited to tell that yeah, story. Yeah, we do have a whole new piece of it. And and the whole Dark Skies thing, uh, you could do an entire show on what was in Dark Skies because that was it was like the most subversive show on TV when it was on. But the, you could also do a show about the behind the scenes of Dark Skies because Brent and I were exposed to a lot of a crazy things. So that we're going to be talking about. What do I think about Harris, though, and, and Weinstein? Look, it sounds to me like they were approached by somebody who at least sounded serious, but it also sounds like they didn't get much proof uh, that this person was who they said they were, um, in which case, yeah, I can see why they would get uh, uh, tired of it. I wanted to bring one other thing up, though, on, uh, on this topic, because um, one of the things Harris said that I found particularly interesting, which is kind of a sidebar issue here, but he said, quote, if this is true, this is the biggest story in anyone's lifetime. Contact with alien intelligence is the biggest story in human history. Why isn't that just totally captivating? He was referring to the fact that he'd kind of burned himself out and he couldn't quite figure out why, if this was so important, he wasn't, uh, you know, all up in arms about it and why his attention was kind of drifting on the topic. Well, <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you something that I bet you could almost uh, match. Um, I've written a UFO book. I've done UFO series. You and I have this podcast. Uh, members of my own family, Ross, my own family believe that I'm, that I'm onto something. They don't think I'm crazy anymore if they ever did. But I don't think a member of my family has even read the UFO book I wrote. And I don't think a member of my family has voluntarily, without me pointing uh, you know, a sharp object at their head, actually watched a Need to Know episode. Now, why is that? It's not because they don't think it's important. It's not because they don't want to support me. It's because there is something about the topic that is so deeply disquieting to at least certain people. Some of us, like you and I, are compelled. We say, this is a effing mystery that must be solved, and we're willing to devote our, our time and resources to solving it. But a whole lot of other people say, yeah, I'll spot you that it's probably real, but I don't really want to talk about it. I don't want to listen to a podcast about it. And this is my own family. So, I mean, I don't know. Do you have any of the same responses? Yeah, I do. It's funny. I, talking about again about Sam Harris, I mean, one of the things he said in the same interview with Lex Fridman was that, quote, he had the impression that no one had, had the bandwidth to even be interested in this UFO, UAP right. issue. And, and he said he was amazed that he wasn't more interested himself in figuring out what was going on. And when he explained this, one of the things that puzzled and slightly disappointed me was that he seemed to be suggesting that he was buying all of the debunking explanations. And he right. cited Vic West's skeptical analysis of some of the recent videos and stated that some of those analyses seemed like credible debunking. Um, I think he was talking about either the um, the gimbal analysis that um, Mick West has done, or maybe he was talking about the bouquet analysis that Mick West has done on the 2019 pyramidal objects over the USS Omaha. And it's interesting because if you balance what Jay Stratton's just told UFO alien con, um, Jay Stratton's basically saying that they did verify pyramidal objects, that they're not easily dismissed as conventional drones. And so my takeaway with this is that there really does need uh, it's time for ufology to step up. And it's not good enough just to basically put stuff out there and make assertions. They need to prove it. Yeah. And so if Mick West is providing debunking arguments, I think those need to be responded to. 
you and I met with um, Jeremy Corbell, and he said categorically mm -hmm. that whatever the pyramidal objects were over USS Omaha, they were not a production of bouquet. Now, as I understand it, and my brain can't deal with the explanation that Mick um, that Mick has to try and explain it here in this show. As I understand it, Mick is basically saying that there is an artifact or a lens situation in the camera which distorts the image to such a degree that it creates a pyramidal object which is not pyramidal and that essentially by implication these objects must be stars. Now whatever the truth is it needs to be scientifically tested and verified and checked. Yep. My, my worry about all of this is that you know at the moment Sam Harris one of the greatest and most influential public intellectuals in America, if not the world, is basically saying he's bought the debunking argument. And that's fair enough if that's the way Sam feels about it. And maybe the reason why he feels that way is because basically ufology is duck and covering. It's not responding to skeptical arguments that are legitimately being put up from time to time by people like Mick West, who some people in ufology may not like, but he needs to be addressed. What he's doing is a very useful and real purpose. He's questioning, which is what we should all be doing. And, and however much people want to believe that he's not correct, there's a conversation here that needs to be had. Don't you agree? Well, I do, but uh, I feel like it's kind of an unfair fight because what you have is you have Mick West and and certain people who feel as he do who who are considered skeptics and and I agree that is a valid and reasonable thing to do with anything that uh, looks like it exists outside of normalcy, uh, and then there's the rest of uh, the people who are looking into it people like Corbell and yourself and myself and other people, but it none of this takes into account the third rail if you will which is the forces of governments around the world and militaries around the world who actually have done work on this. And if they shared even one one hundredth of the work that they've done in the last eight decades, it would have a very important and valuable impact on our ability to assess this thing. Instead, we're being left to do it on our own. And, and of course we will. But, you know, as, as far as Harris though, I just think if he's, you know what, uh, if he feels that way, he should bow out and ask him to uh, find somebody else to brief in. If that's the case, I wish they would brief you in because the truth is if I had to vote for one person who I wanted to be briefed in, who could then brief me and it wasn't me, I would, I would go with you. Uh, when we talk about the secrets of UAP though, you know, you're going to brief people in on the secrets of UAPs. Well, think about it. Would you really fly a couple of guys someplace, take them into some kind of secret facility to brief them on Chinese drones? I, I doubt it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I just really doubt that that would happen. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious here, partially at least, but if Harris, I don't think Harris and Weinstein are necessarily the right people for this anyway, because the truth is if Harris and Weinstein got briefed in and came back out and said, well, we can't really talk too much about this, but we have seen evidence that makes us believe X, Y, and Z. Uh, most people would go, okay, who is Harris? Who's Weinstein? I mean, I'd rather they take Stephen Colbert and Tucker Carlson in and then let them go on the air and talk about it or something. I, I just feel like, uh, the idea that these two guys who, listen, I enjoy hearing both of them talk, and I think they're both very bright, intelligent men, and I think that it's it's all positive uh, that they're now focusing at least some of their energies, uh, intellectual and otherwise, on this topic. But they're not the only guys that can do this, and if if uh, if they're bored, move on. Uh, but and if there are people on the inside, I don't know whether they're in private enterprise or in the government. I would simply say to them, those who are listening right now, get your act together, figure out what you can tell in terms of sharing your work. Start, if you have to start slowly, start sharing it. But come on, Tom DeLong was not the best possible person to share it with, if indeed that's what happened. And neither would Sam Harris or Eric Weinstein be the, the go-to guys. There's probably other uh, people out there who could do this as well. Let's get this process going. Enough of this screwing around. I'm tired of it. Let's let's go on to another issue now, Bryce, which 
actually raises some of the same issues. Um, Avi Loeb, Professor Avi Loeb from the Harvard University Galileo Project and the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office boss, Sean Kirkpatrick, published a new, not yet peer-reviewed article that was um, co-written together uh, entitled Physical Constraints on Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. And a lot of people in ufology took a huge swipe at Professor Loeb for basically collaborating with what they perceive to be the enemy, Sean Kirkpatrick, the head of ARO. And frankly, I think that's puerile. I really do. I think it's important that there be scientific collaboration. And if the head of the UFO UAP investigation office in the Pentagon is prepared to sit down and write a paper that discusses issues with what objects ordinarily do in the atmosphere uh, and how they should behave and how it's not capable of being explained with, you know, there's two explanations that come out in the paper. It, it spends a lot of time speculating about how and why an extraterrestrial intelligence would end up in our <clears> backyard, <throat> but it makes a whole lot of conclusions about the physics, the, the limitations with our understanding of Newtonian physics behind the sightings that have happened. And one of the points that they make is that if, if in Newtonian physics, if an object moves as fast as these objects do in the atmosphere, these solid objects, there should be friction. And, the, you know, you should be seeing some kind of um, a heat signature in the U.S. Navy videos. And they're trying in the paper to explain why there was none. Now, a lot of people in the UFO Twitter world basically spend a large part of their time and energy attacking Sean Kirkpatrick and Avi Loeb for doing this collaboration. And I just think that's silly because what they were doing was starting a scientific debate. You know, the point that they were making was that highly manoeuvrable UFO sightings indeed appear to not abide by the known laws of physics as a bright optical fireball should be created by the abiding, the ensuing friction. And so what they were basically saying is that there's a useful limit on observations of UAP that, that bound the hypothetical explanations, and that's known science. And essentially, they're suggesting that there's a problem with the sensors. They're throwing it back on the sensors, and they're suggesting that, for example, one of the most common sets of data within the military holdings comes from forward-looking infrared pods, and they provide an accurate resolved image of relative thermal measurements. And typical UAP sightings, they contend in their paper, are too far away to get a highly resolved image of an object and that the determination of the object's motion is limited by the lack of range data. Now, this is relevant, Bryce, because what they appear to be suggesting is that some of the most important videos, the gimbal video, the GoFast video, all of these objects that have been recorded on, in some cases, FLIR imaging, have limitations because of the limitations of those sensors. And it's not good enough for us just to basically say, well, obviously, there's a new type of physics involved. Whatever these objects are, they are um, they're moving at speeds that humans have not yet conceived. Therefore, it must be aliens. It must be anomalous. It must be paranormal. The simple fact is that what Loeb and Kirkpatrick are doing is setting the argument because they're saying that another possible explanation is that we're perhaps drawing conclusions from sensor systems which are not equipped to provide us with the conclusions that we think we can validly draw. Do you see my point? I do. Um, it's a very complex thing. Uh, let's put it this way. I'm not uh, affiliated with UFO Twitter, although I hashtag them when I post on Twitter, and and uh, there are a lot of really great people in it. Um I do think uh, the sensor thing, as I read the article, kind of set me off a little bit because when we talk about limitation of sensors, all right, and we say, well, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's why we have this issue and we can't really tell what, what's going on because the sensors are limited. Well, maybe. I mean, or maybe there are better sensors that, again, have been highly classified and we're not allowed to even know they exist. I still think that those three videos that came out five years ago, uh, there's probably really great versions of them that exist. I've been told that there are. I've been told that Congress has seen them. So I'm not going to get into censor bashing here. Uh, I also have a question is, what is Sean Kirkpatrick's job? 
Why is he writing an article with Avi Loeb at this particular point? Um, I think that Sean Kirkpatrick ought to, you know, if his job is to run the uh, all domain anomaly resolution office, um, I don't think he needs to be co-writing scientific papers. He needs to be getting that office up on its feet, lobbying for as much money as he can get to investigate things and start reaching. Hell, if you want, Sean, if you're looking for somebody to write an article with you, Ross and I volunteer right here and there. Can I make one point though? I mean, the thing yeah. that did frustrate me about the Avi Loeb, Sean Kirkpatrick paper is that they drew their attention, their, their their criticism of the limitations of the data to the FLIR imaging data, which they know is right. the only data in the public domain, apart from the direct pilot Correct. evidence. Now, we know that there is other sensor data yes. from the E2 Hawkeye, from the USS Princeton and the Nimitz incident, uh, and from other aircraft in the area. We know that the data tapes, the data disks have been downloaded. And what I was looking for in that article was an acknowledgement from Sean Kirkpatrick of AARO RO, that, that there is, in fact, other data. And he didn't do that. And I do think it is a legitimate criticism of Professor Loeb that he didn't ask his co-author to actually say, well, where the hell is this other data? You know, it's all very well focusing just on the FLIR imaging data and making the criticism that the FLIR imaging data has its limitations. If you're the head of the Pentagon's UFO office, you right. by definition have access to all of the data, including the data bricks, which were taken off the Nimitz and the Princeton. And that's what I think requires explanation from this article. I think it's good, frankly, that the head of a UFO program in the Pentagon is being seen to be having a conversation with an authoritative Harvard University scientist who's wanting to discuss this issue. But frankly, if we're going to talk about data, we do need to talk about all of the data and not be selective and cherry picking. And moreover, I would have liked to have seen in that article an acknowledgement that even conventional physics is beginning to acknowledge that there is a possible explanation, a hypothesis that's been hypothesized with the Alcubia drive, which is this notion that one can distort space time, that with adequate energy, um, you can create a bubble in front of a craft, which basically allows it to move through space and time. And I appreciate that's only a, a hypothesis in um, qu quantum physics, but it's one that a lot of people are talking about. And I would have liked to have seen the paper taking that kind of stuff into consideration. Me too. Um, look, I, I have, uh, it's a complex thing, as I said. Uh, Avi Loeb, uh, Dr. Loeb has become the go-to guy. The media needs someone to talk about this. Hey, let's get Loeb on the line. He's a Harvard guy, and that'll sound really good. Um, but as you pointed out, the man is not a journalist. He is a astronomer uh, from Harvard, um, and he knows a lot. But he he doesn't know about follow up questions. He doesn't know about putting holding people's feet to the fire. You know, I, I urge uh, again uh, uh, Sean Kirkpatrick to broaden his horizons a little bit. I'd like to see Loeb and his Galileo project um, come up with something. I'd like to see what they're thinking. Uh, I, I'm less interested in in uh, media collaborations. But you know what? Um, we're 50 minutes into this thing. I think we should think about wrapping it up and. One of the things we promised to do, and you know, thank you for your comments about the historical here. I, I do think that it's important for us to communicate to the people who listen to us and people who watch us um, that there is a large context to this phenomenon. And the attempts over the last uh, five years to portray it, not only in government reports, but frankly, in the, the ramifications the media takes from those reports, leaves people with the impression, oh my God, this is an acute problem that started in 2004. And as I said uh, earlier, that's not the case. You can pick any place in the last eight decades and you'll find hundreds of cases, if not thousands of cases, every single year. So just looking back 50 years from uh, today into 1973, uh, you know, let's face it, I, I just did a very quick little run through of some of the books I have on my shelf. And I know you could do the same and your book is one of the good ones. But 1973 was a year that ushered in a UFO flap. They were all over the place. They they were even happening in the Hudson Valley of New York. Uh, uh, 
1973 gave us KUFOS for the first time, the Center for UFO Studies run by Alan Hynek. And at that time, there were three other investigative groups going, APRO, MUFON, and NICAP. These are four groups looking into UFOs. Why? Because, because there was something there. Uh, and, and you couldn't count on the government to do it anymore because they had killed uh, Project Blue Book uh, in 1969. So uh, people had to do then what we are doing now. We're going to step up when the government uh, is coming short. Uh, I know also that, as I said earlier, the juiciest rumor of the year was the Nixon-Gleason thing. But there's also an incredibly high profile abduction case that year, the, the Hicks uh, Parker case uh, from uh, uh, in Pascagoula. And uh, that was a, a terrific one where two guys said they'd been abducted. Hardly the kind of guys to make this up. The police put them in a room together and record them thinking they'll hear them talking about the hoax they're having. And instead, they're both talking about what it was like to be on board a craft. So, and, and, and again, thousands of cases just from that year. So I just want to urge people, anytime you feel like you're getting snowed, get a good UFO historical book and start plowing through some of these cases and you will be amazed. You'll be amazed by a couple things. You'll be amazed that there are so many of these cases worth talking about. And you'll be amazed that many of them sound pretty close to what we're experiencing now. And uh, you'll see that this is something that's not brand new. Uh, it's something that's been going on. It is a phenomenon. And if it's Chinese drones, then it means they're time traveling Chinese drones, as I said. So, uh, I, I'm, I, I guess, I guess, and by the way, I just give you this one. There's also a great case from Australia, which you yourself have covered from 1973. It's one of the greatest cases I've ever heard. Why don't you give us the short strokes on that one? Oh, I've made a lot of this case. It's um, my favourite part of Mystery Australia is the Northwest Cape Harold E. Holt Naval Communications Station. It's 25th of October, 1973. And sadly, Israel is under attack from uh, various Arab states and there's a Mideast Arab-Israeli war going on. And what's happening in the White House is uh, the Nixon presidency is falling apart. Apparently, President Nixon's drunk in bed. And Henry Kissinger's up late at night having to deal with the fact that um, they're very worried about the possibility that the Russians are going to deploy troops into the Middle East and we could end up with a confrontation between Russia backing Syria and other nations on one side and America backing Israel on the other. And it could lead to a nuclear war. And so what Kissinger does, and this is recorded in the... Um, White House records of the time is he he orders a lifting in the DEFCON status. I think it went from um, uh, DEFCON 4 to DEFCON 3, which is the highest defense condition for peacetime. It's literally at the point where troops are being deployed to be in position for war. It's where aircraft are being deployed for bombing. And what happens at the same time is an order goes out to nuclear submarines around the world, American nuclear submarines with nuclear weapons, to essentially be aware that the DEFCON status is being raised. And that order, most Australians still to this day don't know this, it goes out from this base in northwestern Australia. And it goes out from these very, very low frequency antennae just sitting on the coast near the Indian Ocean. And there are these American subs way, way out in the Indian Ocean who, because of the signal, come further to the surface to get the full command orders. At around about the same time that that order goes out, the deputy commander of the base walks out and looks up over the base and there's a charcoal black colored sphere hovering over the base. And we know this because he made a written report of it to the Australian Air Force sightings investigators. And so did a fireman on the base, a guy called Bill Lynn. And he drew it and described it to his family afterwards and said that what he saw, he thought, was alien. Now, that incident to this day has never been explained, ever. And moreover, even though the documents were provided officially to UAP investigators in the 1980s, I think my colleague Bill Chalker or um, my other colleague Keith Basterfield, those documents that recorded these incidents appear to have disappeared from Australian archives. But they are real, and we know they're real because the, um, the people who were involved, at least one of them, has described the incident. 
So yes, Bryce, to underline the point that you're making, even half a century ago, October 1973, these incidents were occurring, they were unexplained, and mate, as you say, they sure as hell weren't Chinese drones. (laughs) No, they weren't. Listen, uh, I know we're wrapping up, so let me just... uh go back to one thing. Last year, as we wrapped up in December of 2022, I think we did a show where we were talking about whether 2023 would be a sizzle or a fizzle, right? Uh, In terms of UAP, UFO disclosure. And as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, but I took the sizzle. It was going to sizzle. It was going to be a big year. And I believe you took the fizzle uh, that that it was, we were going to put our toe up there and pull it back. Well, what I do you take? Do. What's your take now? Oh, you still think it's a fizzle? I still think it's a fizzle because, frankly, we're not seeing any hard evidence, mate. I mean, basically, yeah. at the moment, I still think there's a pushback. I still think that what's happening is that uh, even though our friends Tim Burchett and um, uh, others are being shown images um, that we're not allowed to see, we're not getting to see them. We're not getting to see the evidence. And when people like Avi Loeb and Sean Kirkpatrick publish papers, they're not publishing the full data that we know is in possession of the Pentagon. If there is to be a clear and full public reckoning on this issue, then all of this data needs to be revealed publicly and discussed. If there's nothing to hide, why why continue to lock it up? I mean, just today, I noticed that um, there's been another revelation from Jacques Vallée's Forbidden Science Diaries, Volume 5. And it turns out that um, on the 26th of March, 2004, Jacques Vallée recorded that um, Eric Davis uh, was told by Bush Sr., President Bush Sr., that what happened um, at the uh, uh, in the Holloman film, the um, uh, the claims of the uh, is it the Holloman Air Force Base, yeah, right? Um, where allegedly an alien craft allegedly landed was the real thing, and apparently Eric was told there was a secret project and the security was obscene. Well, frankly, whilst Jacques Vallée's diary is hearsay evidence, what should be happening to get that as evidence, as data that we can yes. analyze, is people need to be called. Witnesses need to be called and questioned. If he hasn't been already, Eric Davis needs to be put before a committee in the Congress and questioned under oath. And so, for that matter, does anyone who knows anything about the Holloman film? Why Why do we piss around with secondhand hearsay all the time? That's my point. That's what needs to be happening. So I'll leave you with this thought. Uh, that is all true and eloquently stated as usual. So I, I'm looking for uh, the idea that it's possible that we're going to have to use some tools that have been used before to pry all this information out. Maybe it's a time for real activism because uh, UFO uh, slash UAP openness, transparency, disclosure has never really caught the public on fire, maybe for the very reason I was talking about when I can't even get my family to watch our show. But a little activism could go a long way toward demanding some of the things that you're talking about. And now that we're actually speaking more freely about it, maybe that's the time. And maybe, maybe, as you know, as a journalist, one good strong leak could quite a difference make. I mean, look at the uh, look at the Vietnam papers that came out in the in the sixties. I mean, anything could happen. So I'm kind of hopeful. I got. I'm still on the sizzle wagon. I think something's going to happen. I don't know what it is. It's going to be surprising, and I'm ready to say we're out of here. Well, hopefully, we'll know sometime this year. Fizzle or sizzle. I think that's all for need to know for this week. Thank you very much for joining us. See you next time. Bye, everybody. We can handle the truth. People get ready.